that you may be able to recall these things. Verses 1 through 4 of 366. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who on the holy mount revealed to chosen witnesses your well-beloved Son, wonderfully transfigured in raiment white and glistening, mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquietude of this world, may by faith behold the King in his beauty, who with you, O Father, and you, O Holy Spirit, lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain, 
with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. So when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with him, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We will read Psalm 99 in unison. The Lord is king, let the people tremble. He is enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion, he is high above all peoples. Let them confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One. O mighty king, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his toast of testimony the decree that he gave them. You answered them indeed. You were a God who forgave them, yet punished them for their evil deeds. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is the Holy One. The second reading is, is from Peter. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to refresh your memory, since I know that my death will come soon, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory and saying, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic me message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be active to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will. But men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God, the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now about eight days after Jesus had foretold his death and resurrection, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who spoke with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he had said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one of any of the things that they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, so it's a wonderful, another wonderful, another wonderful Sunday. You know, every Sunday is Easter Sunday, right? Everybody knows that, right? Every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so every Sunday is a chance to just throw off the weight of the day, throw off the problems we have. You brought them all here, and you know where you can leave them? Right there, the foot of the cross. Either now, go ahead, or, or when you come up for communion, however it is that you can let go of the of the problems, of the issues, of the things that burden you, even what's going to happen this afternoon, whatever that is, just let that go. On Resurrection Day, God comes to take away all of our pain. And this is Resurrection Day. Just just to make it more pointed, every day, every day is Resurrection Day. It's just the Sundays we get to come together here and celebrate it again. And as we celebrate the resurrection, we look back at specific times through the recitation of scripture and sometimes through the celebration of special events. And this day is a celebration of a high holy, high holy blessing, a tribute. This is the day that we celebrate the transfiguration. And there are so many ways that we can do that on our own. In fact, I'm going to suggest one to you in just a minute. But first, I want you to take a look at this on the front cover, the cover of your bulletin. So this is a pretty pretty thing, isn't it? It's kind, of, it's kind of subdued in its color. This, this is a icon. Now, I don't mean like a movie star or a rock star or even a car, you know, an icon of a time or an icon of a place or an icon of something else. This is an icon as we think of an iconography. This early Eastern uh, gift, gift to Christianity to represent the person of God and the actions that we hear in the Bible, the the witness of the biblical story told in in one-dimensional art. Now, I maybe even should not not use the word art, because when we think of art, we think Michelangelo and Rembrandt and Picasso and all these great people. And one of the things that we do when we think about art in that way, which is Western art, you know, Renaissance time, we think of three dimensions. We think in beauty about the depths of painting, like you can look into the painting, and we judge how sophisticated or gifted the artist is by how real the person looks. Here's a little secret. When you look at art, see if the person's standing like this, or if they're like this. Because hands were really hard, really, really hard, and the better artists were the only ones that could successfully paint a good hand. So if you couldn't do a good hand, you weren't that good, then you always painted them like this, hidden up to the wrist, or like that. Just a side note. So that's the art that we see in the West, but this is one-dimensional art. So here's the, here's the little homework I'm going to give you, something to do this week. Go home after today, sometime this week, if not this afternoon, and Google icons of the transfiguration. Now, if you're familiar with Google, you know that underneath that, that place where you're going to write it in, or if you write it in down here, if you look up, when you instead of just hitting go, 
there are these little sections right above it, at the top of the, that far down the page it says images, or all, or maps. Well, instead of just hitting go, hit images. And it will bring up pages of icons of the transfiguration. And unlike this one, which is rather subdued, some of them are really bright. Bright blue, bright reds, bright greens, quite spectacular. They are the newer icons, but what you will find is that all the icons, well, almost all the icons, are this, this motif, this model, the same way, with Jesus in the middle, different ways of making Jesus spectacular and the two men, and then the disciples here, Peter, James, and John, kind of like cowering down. You notice that Peter over here is on the left. He's the only one looking up. The other two are looking down, they're all like this. Because in the Eastern understanding of icon, this is a, a not supposed to be, you're not supposed to look at this and say, oh, this is a beautiful painting. Rembrandt was so wonderful. You're looking at this one dimensionally with these, these characters that, that don't stand out because you're not trying to focus on the character, but you're trying to focus on God and through the Holy Spirit to go beyond the icon into the companionship, asking God, to come into the self, to illuminate my heart, my mind, my understanding, so that through this icon, I have an experience of the divine. This is why icons are called windows to the soul, or windows of the soul. Not stopping there, but going through that to find God. Now, this one, you say, well, Father Bill, why didn't you put one of the fancy ones on here with all the color? I know that's what you're thinking. Why did I put one that's subdued on here? Because this is the first icon that we know of, of the transfiguration, the very first one. Justinian the Great commissioned this icon in about 530 AD. He wanted this to be lifted up and become, uh, have a place of, of prominence because this is an incredibly important high holy days for the Christian faith. And so to get this icon, you know, you think about icons, I have several in my office and they're about this big maybe a little bigger. This one's a lot bigger. So Justinian, to make sure that this had a place that was prominent, he commissioned to have this as a mosaic, this is actually a mosaic, in the apse of the monastery church of St. Catherine. So an apse, if you ever go into a church, if you came in here and you were walking up here, instead of the wall being here, the wall would be back maybe 10, 15, 20 feet. And the, no matter what was going on here, the ceiling would be rounded. That's the apse. So when you go into churches with apses, oftentimes you'll find them painted in beautiful expressions of the biblical witness. So he decided he wanted this in that place of prominence and a place where pilgrims went. So he put it he commissioned it for the Church of the Monastery of St. Catherine. Now, where is that and what is that? St. Catherine, I'm not going to get into all that. You have to look up St. Catherine. But her body was delivered by, by holy messenger to a mountain. And the monks and the clergy that were at this church, this church monastery, which had a different name at the time, found her body by, by divine direction and brought her body to the church and renamed the church and monastery the Church Monastery of St. Catherine. That church monastery is at the base of Mount Sinai. Saint, Mount of St. Catherine is beyond that, one, one over. So that church down there, you wonder why it's not called the Church of St. Moses or whatever, it's because that's where the body of St. Catherine is to this day. She lies behind, behind the altar, behind the small wall below the apse. So he had this brought there, and why? Okay, so, so he had this brought there because of the connection to Moses. Moses up on Mount Sinai, I think he's right in the picture right here. He said, okay, we've got to have this here for the pilgrims to come because the pilgrims have to know this. They have to see this. They have to remember this. This is not just a, where I go and I see something and I leave and I go, well, that was fun. What happened? I can't remember that. This was this prominent icon with the, connected with their journey to this church was to burn into their heart and burn into their mind. And so he said, at this place and this time as we read today, Moses came here with the children of Israel, the, the exodus, the, the liberation from slavery, and went up the mountain and spoke with God. And when he did this, the exposure to God, being exposed to God, okay, shone on him. His face shone as a reflection of the glory of the divine. He didn't make this shining. 
He just reflected this shining, so much so that when he came down from the mountain, as the story says, people were afraid of him. It was weird. He's all glowy. So he put this shade on his face so you couldn't see a little veil. Now, what they don't hear, what we don't hear here, is that while this went on for a while, after a while, it faded. And he didn't wear the veil anymore. He didn't have to. It, it went away. It was only there as a response, a reflection to the presence of the divine. That reflection came to him from something not himself, outside of him. He also brought this icon to the, to the monastery church of St. Catherine because of Elijah. Look, he's right there too. Now, who is Elijah? Elijah was this prophet that was foretold that Elijah would have to return to the children of Israel, to the earth, and to herald in the coming of the Messiah. This played a prominent role later on when Jesus was there. We'll get to that in a minute. But right now, we know Isaiah as one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament and, and a powerful prophet when you read about what Isaiah was capable or Elijah was capable of doing. So there was a time when, when Elijah went to war with 70 prophets of Baal. And just to skip to the end, they all died. But when they all died, there was a, a death warrant put out for Elijah. And Elijah, in that moment of weakness, because we all have them, even the best of us, he ran away. He said, I can't stay here. They're going to kill me. So he ran, and he left, and he took him weeks to get where he was going, and he decided, I'm going to go to Mount Sinai because that's where Moses was, and I can respite there. So he got to Mount Sinai, and he climbed it. I've climbed it. You go up Mount Sinai, you get two-thirds of the way up, and there's this little weird, like, field thing, little grassy area. It's kind of big, actually. And there's a cave right there. Now, that... A place is called Elijah's Plateau today. So if you go there, you'll go up to Elijah's Plateau. You can't stop anywhere along the way, believe me. You have to go up to Elijah's Plateau. And if you want to go to the top of Mount Sinai, it's 1,000 feet more, and there are steps straight up that the monks down at St. Catherine carved into the mountain all the way to the top. And they're not normal steps. <laughs> so. so Elijah went in the cave. Remember what happened? He went in the cave, and God came, and the wind blew, and the tumult came there, and the rocks split, and the, 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 the tree limbs hit. It was all this noise and commotion, but God was not the wind. God was not in the wind. God was not the noise. God was not all this tumult. And then there was nothing, complete silence, like profound silence, silence that we never hear. That sounds weird, but it's true. We never hear true silence. There's only a few places... We can go in the world. I used to take people caving. When we got far back in the caves, we would rest. Jenny, Jenny did this with us before, before we got married. Way back in the cave, I had people stop and turn off their flashlights and just sit. And I never did this, ever, where somebody couldn't make it. Somebody always stops and says, how long are we going to do this? Why aren't we doing this? What's happening? Because there's a ringing in your ears, and you can't stop. It gets so loud, it's almost deafening. And you want noise to happen to stop it. But if you don't stop it, if you sit there, it only takes like maybe three, four minutes, the, the ringing dies down, and there's silence. Real silence. Well, that's our effort to find silence. And, oh, by the way, when we did that, and it finally got quiet. It was the first time that any of us heard the water dripping. Before that, we couldn't hear that water at all because it was too loud in our heads, in our ears. That was us trying to find the silence. For Elijah, it was God. God giving to him in, in opposition to all that had just happened. Giving to him this image of God's presence. God was not the sound or the wind or the breaking. That was all this, the earth, the tumult that we live in. God comes in just the silence. In fact, it says when God spoke, the, the translations sometimes say God, God speaking was the silence, a still, small voice where God speaks, speaks to Elijah. Now, what is happening here? God is saying to Elijah, or showing Elijah, that God is not breaking in from out here. God is rising up from in here. And it's from our 
turning to God and allowing God and seeking after God that we hear the voice of God, that we, that we see the glory of God, the divinity of God. And seeing and hearing, we are transformed. We are transfigured in ourselves. We become someone, something else than just this thing that encounters all of this stuff and tries to do it all. Now we are free, like on Resurrection Sunday, to give our problems and our, our pain and our worries over to God. But no longer needing the church to come and sit, but being able to do it at any time, especially at the times when we cannot function properly because of the weight of our life. All of this given to Elijah and now to us, just in this little event. And so he put this icon in this place, this place where these two icons of the faith came, Mount Sinai for Moses and Elijah, to learn these lessons and to display these lessons to us as we grow in our understanding of the faith and reaction and response to God. This is, this is exactly what was happening as he portrayed this on Mount Sinai, right? So he, Jesus says, I have to tell you, the, what I read in the gospel was a little different than yours, right? It started out differently. There was a little lead in there. Right before this passage in the gospel is the passage in the gospel where Jesus stops on the road with the disciples and said, says, they all sit down. He says, who do the people say that I am? Remember this? And they say, some say you're John the Baptist brought back to life. And what did Jesus say about John the Baptist? They ask about John. He said, John the Baptist is this this times Elijah, thereby fulfilling the prophecy that Elijah has to come before the Messiah. So some say you're, you're John the Baptist, so they're saying you're, you're the, this times herald. Then others say you are Elijah. You are the prophet Elijah, come back. How could Elijah do that? Because Elijah didn't die. Remember this story? You know the movie Chariots, from, Chariots of Fire? Remember that one? A long time ago? Elijah went and the chariot of fire came down from heaven and swooped up Elijah and took him back. He's not bodily on the earth. He's one of the only people in scripture that was bodily taken to heaven. So Elijah could bodily come back and walk along and become the herald for the Christ. So they say, maybe you're, the, you're, the, you're Elijah. That's who you are. Not, not brought back to life, but living now back here on earth. And Jesus says, okay, I got that. Now who do you say that I am? And everybody looks at their shoes. Until Peter's had enough, and he jumps up and says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And what does Jesus say? Bless you, Simon bar for your human eyes and your human brain and your human way of doing things did not show you this. But the interior, small voice, the beauty and the wonder and the majesty of God has made this known to you so that you could proclaim it to me and to us. And blessed are you. And then Jesus, because now this moment has come, says, and I want to tell you, now that you've said this and you all are pumped up, you know who I am, I'm going to tell you that the Son of Man, and that's, that's the Messiah, when you refer to yourself as the Son of Man, it's in Daniel, he's the Messiah, he's taken on this title. The Son of Man will go to Jerusalem, will be betrayed by evil men, will be crucified, and the third day rise again. And of course, loving Peter, I love Peter, open mouth, insert foot, jumps up, comes over to Jesus, turns him around, says, hey, no, 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 no. You can't say that. Don't say that anymore. Take that back. And Jesus pushes him away. What does he say? Get behind me, Satan. And then in an embarrassing thing, instead of having that quiet little conversation, turns back to the disciples and, and blares it out. Not keeping it a secret. And what does he say? He just told Peter that divine intervention, divine presence, that the reality of God, that still small voice, is what has told Peter the truth about God's self in the person of the Christ, of Jesus of Nazareth. That is God speaking. But Peter now has thrown off God and spoken again from his own want and his own desire. I don't want you to go anywhere. You can't go there and die. We just should stop going there at all. By the way, at this point in Matthew's gospel and in Luke's gospel, it's the turning point. It's the nexus point of the gospel where prior to this, Jesus is out there teaching and raising the dead and, and healing everybody. But now he is turned toward Jerusalem. And while he was still teaching and leading, he's heading that way. He's no longer wandering back and forth. And it's all going to come to fruition there. 
He's saying this, you can't do this, but he says, I have to do this. This is the will that's coming. You just have to keep in mind and keep yourself on track. What are you listening to? Are you listening to yourself and what you want and what you desire and what you have to have? Are you listening to my Father? Are you listening to that still, small voice? Are you allowing the divine light of Christ, of God, to manifest itself in your heart and in your mind? Can you put down those troubles? Can you lay down those burdens? Gosh, if you're a strong person, and I think everybody here is a strong person, we have a tendency to hang on to the things that hurt us because we're going to best them. Those pains and those difficulties, I'm going to get over it. Pull myself up by my bootstraps. You ever try to do that? I used to do that here. I had, a pair of, I had a pair of boots with straps on, I'd wear them. And I'd bend over and I'd grab a hold of that strap and I'd yank until I had a vein pop in my forehead. You can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can't get anywhere. You just strain yourself to death. No. No. He now has turned, that's where we pick up, and gone, he's on his way to Jerusalem, and this is where we start off. And Jesus took with them, they have walked and walked and walked, and they have come to a mount. Which mount? We don't know if it's Mount Tabor, that's one view, or Mount, mount Hermon, that's another view. Really big debate going on because they're very far apart. But whatever it was, it doesn't matter. You know, God loves mountains, right? God has mountains all through scripture. So it's the mountain that counts. It's the mountain. God Jesus goes to this mountain, and it, Jesus, what's his practice? Is to pray. He goes off by himself and prays. If you're watching The Chosen at all, if you've watched it, there's a great uh, depiction of this, because the, the, they shows the disciples in town, and they're like meeting, and someone walks in and goes, where's Jesus? And they go, I don't know, he's praying. Because he just said, I'm going to go pray. They don't know where he went. He just disappeared. He'd go pray. He said, I, I need to be in communion with my Father. I need to be in a place of prayer that is not everywhere. I love it. Guys, pray at the stoplights. Go ahead. Every day, pray at the stoplights. Pray wherever you go. But there is something divinely intended for going away to that quiet place and praying. Just you and God. Remember what Jesus said. Go into your room and pray in secret and your Father in secret will see you. So Jesus would go off and pray, but this time he said, Peter, James, and John, you come with me up the mountain. Oh boy, okay, this is a treat. So they went up the mountain with him. Now we assume that it was probably nighttime, maybe dusk, because what does it say? They were very tired. They were falling asleep, overborn, burdened with sleep. Probably seven o'clock at night, maybe. They've been climbing since three, I don't know. So they climb up the mountain, they stop somewhere on the mountain, and Jesus starts to pray. So they're like, okay, he's praying, now let's sit down. Let's sit down. He's going to pray. Kind of like the Garden of Gethsemane. He's over there praying, so we're just going to sit here. And it's a great thing, because it says, when they did this, they said, uh, uh, and he, while you're praying, his appearance of his face changed, his clothes became dazzling white. In, Ma in Matthew's Gospel, it says his face becomes like the sun. Radiant like the sun. You can imagine that bursting, like you can't hardly see him for the light. The appearance of his face changed, his clothes became dazzling white, and suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking with them. There's two things here. One, you know, when Moses received that glory of God and his face shone, that was the reflection of God shining in him. That is not this. This is not God reflected in the person of Christ. This is God showing forth God's self. This is important for us because this is the moment when Jesus of Nazareth, the human Messiah, showed himself to be the second person of the Trinity, the eternal son of the living God. Now, standing before them to say, you've seen me do the miracles, you've seen me do this, you've heard the words, now look, look on me. Look on me and know. And he sees these two men, Moses and Elijah, and we say, oh, how do they know that? You know, if, if Abraham Lincoln popped right here. Ta -da. Everybody here would know that was Abraham Lincoln. Right? <laughs> Nobody would go, who's that? Because we know what he looks like. We all know what he looks like. But there was no pictures of Moses and Elijah. There were no icons back then. Not even, you know, similar things. How did they know? Because the reality of the presence of these people was a gift to them by God. The question of who they were was not a question. 
It was a reality in the moment, like water. I look at something, I see it's water. That's water. This was the gift of God to know who they were. Because that was part of the witness of the reality of God and the person of Jesus Christ. They see the two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to them. And they appeared in their glory. That means they had a little shiny thing going on, right? And they were speaking what? Of his departure. You see, if he had not told them back there with that thing about Peter, that he was going to depart this world, he was going to die, then having Moses and Elijah come and talk about his departure wouldn't make any sense. They'd be asking themselves, where's he going? But now they know. They also know that the reality of Christ's departure from the world was a intention of God's grace and God's glory and God's love. No matter how much it hurts me, no matter how much pain it causes me, I'm hoping Peter was thinking, this is to bring God glory, to show God's love in the world, God's light in the world, and the possibility of God's presence to generation after generation to Sunday morning services of the resurrection. Now Peter and his companions are way down, there you go, that they said oh, he's happy to be here, right? So he says they were way down asleep, and they stayed awake. He said, Peter says, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said. What was he said? What would happen? Ah, it's that breaking again. Now I know who Moses and Elijah are. I see the presence of God in Jesus Christ. But, 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 but me, I don't want this to end. I'm sure that if Abraham Lincoln stood right here, and he said, hey, anybody want to know anything? Oh, my gosh. We would be, whoosh, everybody here would be coming forward and asking questions. And if he sat down there, we would sit for him as long as he wanted. If he said, okay, bye, five seconds after he got here, we'd be like, no, don't go, stay. Because we want to learn. We want to know something. We want to touch him. We want to see if he's real. The Feast of Booths is this recollection of the time of, of, the, of the Israelites wandering in the desert. And you literally, if you know any, any Orthodox Jews right now, they should be building a little booth in their backyard, and they go out and they sleep in that booth for seven days to honor the, the, the exodus, this travel, right? So he's saying, we're going to build three booths for you three, and maybe we'll get some later on, maybe we won't have any, we'll sleep in the dirt, it doesn't matter, because we're going to keep you here for seven days. You're going to be here, and we're going to be here, we're all going to be together, you're not going to go anywhere, we're going to immortalize this moment so we'll always know about it, we'll always have it. Maybe we'll come back up here and we'll visit the booths and say, we were there. It's not too strange that, that Peter did this, right? What do we do when we want to immortalize a moment? We used to have to take it with us and prepare. Now it's just whipped out. We take a picture. We take that picture to remember where we are and what we're doing. This was all he was doing. He was making kind of a physical picture that would add to the experience for him to remember and to spend time and talk and learn. But that was not the point, not knowing what he said. He wasn't listening again with his heart. He wasn't seeing God through the Spirit. He wasn't looking at the Christ and understanding God's will and purpose for this moment. While he was saying this confirmation, a cloud came and overshadowed them. Mountains, right? Praying alone and clouds. God loves clouds. Pillar of cloud by day, cloud over the mountain, Mount Sinai. God loves to come in clouds. Cloud came down. These guys would know exactly what's going on. This imagery is light in their lives because they are Jewish and they've learned this from the time that they're this big, a cloud descending this way. And they were terrified because they know God is in the cloud. And they hear this voice. This is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. There's only three times in the New Testament that God spoke this way. One time was at his baptism. This is my son, the beloved, in whom I'm well pleased. This is the second one. Listen to him, is what God is saying. The third time was before the crucifixion. Remember? Jesus said, think about what I said a few minutes ago. Jesus said, Father, that you may be given glory. And God says back to him, I am, I have been given glory, and I will be given glory again. That's all he says. What is he saying? He's saying, I have been given glory in you, in the life that you have taken, in this thing that you are doing. And when you die and when you rise, I will be glorified again. Because the gift, the final gift of my love for you will show forth for all time. 
and they will come to you and you will spread your word. It will be a miraculous life for all people who embrace you. Listen to him. When the voice was gone, Jesus was standing there and not shiny anymore because he was not reflecting the glory of God. He was projecting the glory of God. And when this moment is over, that projection stopped and Moses and Elijah were gone because this was all for them. This moment, as so many others of Jesus' ministry and his life, was for them. They don't need to take a picture. They don't need to build booths. This whole point is so that they know who he is. They embrace who he is. They hear that small voice in here. The light of Christ, the light of God shines in here and in here. The knowledge and love of the Lord building to a crescendo in our lives so that we no longer need a place or a time to give back to God the burdens that we carry, but that we just let them go. Because he's with us always, even until the end of the age. You know, I've often said that if Jesus came, if he came, he was born, he lived, he rose the dead, he healed the people, he did all this marvelous stuff, he was crucified, dead and buried, rose and went to heaven, and nobody remembered, he'd have to do it again. And again, and again, 73 times until they remembered. Because that's the point. It is to remember the reality of the love of God present to us, as us, and, re and retained with us through all time. This is the gift that God gives and continues to give. Listen to him. This is the command that God gives. How do I gain this ability? How do I live in this place of giving back to God the things that burden me and receiving from God the, the joy and felicity and the, the freedom of the Spirit? Listen to Him. How do we know Him? He's right here. He's right there. The words of our Lord come to us through Scripture, and it is through the words that we grow in our understanding of the person. And in the understanding of the person, we draw closer together. Think of people you know. You don't know this guy, this lady, you haven't talked to him, you don't know them. You begin to talk to them, you get to know them a little better. And if you talk to them enough over a year or 10 or 50, you're just like that. You know everything about them. You laugh when they laugh, you cry when they cry. You're just together in all things. This is the gift, the Word. It's no mystery why the second person of the Trinity, the Word, is the Son that comes to us. It is through the Word that we are given this introduction and the deepening of this relationship with our God. And when we are open enough to this relationship, as Paul, or as Peter keeps saying, he says, we have this prophetic message, it's fully confirmed. You will do well to be attended to this as a lamp shining in a dark place, dark in here, shining until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. I want the morning star in my heart. Who doesn't? How do I invite him in to stay? How do I keep him there without trying to muscle God into a place out of my want and desire. The invitation stays open. The door stays open as I turn to the word and hear the voice and know the reflective love and the presence of God. Jesus never said, this will take no effort on your part. I wish it wasn't work. I wish that, that even for those people in history that you've known and we've read and we've heard about that received epiphanies of the presence of God where God was just right there in their life and it changed them and it made them a new person, but you know what it didn't do? It didn't stay. The moment may have stayed with them, but they spent the rest of their life looking for that moment again, writing about it, searching after it. Read about Teresa of Avila. 
changed the life, changed the world. But yet the rest of her life, she searched again for that moment, those moments. For the rest of us who don't have that, we have to work. Turning to the word, reading and studying, turning to each other, growing and understanding. Seeking after what we have found to be true in the relationship we have with Jesus Christ through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Listening to that voice. Listening to that voice. This is my son. Listen to him. Amen. Please stand with me. Together we will say the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He became incarnate Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people and their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, all who work for justice and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, friendless, and the many, for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel, all who seek the truth, We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, all who serve God in this church, for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Pray especially this morning for all members of our parish family and our extended family whom we have named on our prayer list, especially those who are dear to us who are far away, those who are traveling this week or this weekend. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life.
We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion against our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life. The honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Thank you. Wonderful. Appreciate you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, you, do, you do a beautiful job. Oh, my gosh. You hide your nervous well. <laughs> Keep with you. Peace. Please be seated. Good morning. Wonderful, wonderful to be with you. What a great day. And you guys, you guys found the church. Amazing. I, I, was, I had two meetings this week, and I got calls from both people who didn't show up, and they said they couldn't get here. They just drove by. They couldn't, they couldn't get in. They didn't know what to do. You guys are great. There you go. I don't know how long this is going to last. They've, they've uh, covered it over, and hopefully they won't have to dig it up like they did the other two the second time around. So Three times. Three times. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, somebody's lost their shirt on this one, let me tell you. So it's great that you're here. It's great that everything's going the way it is. Um, looking at your announcements, I'll let you do all of them just about. I just have a, a couple things to say about a few. One, the African team ministry things that are outside. This is the last weekend. So if you have any questions about that or you want to pick up something else or just, I was asked last week, someone said, I, don't, I really don't want to take anything, but I want to give a donation. Can I do that? And the answer is absolutely yes. You can do it. Any of the three ways, check, credit card, or cash in the little envelope right there, I'll help you if you need help. Um, summer Fellowship, we have that after this service today, a little table out there. Please stop by and have whatever refreshments are there and take some time just to talk and say hello to each other and we'll have a conversation in a different, different form, which is wonderful, we get to know. Jenny? <laughs> yes, Sharon is our dedicated deviled egg provider, so we're good there. And she has fantastic deviled eggs, too. Sorry, Jenny. Uh, Wednesday, just a plug for you guys. So Wednesday night, we've been watching The Chosen together online, and it is really watching The Chosen is just a, a um, video Bible study. It is a way that we've been able to come at looking at the, watching this together and then talking about it and seeing And I, You know if you haven't seen this on your own, please watch this. And if you'd like to join us, except for this is the last Sunday, this is the last Wednesday until we get to another, the last season, go back and watch The Chosen. The one, the one thing that the people, everybody, me included, say over and over and over again when we watch it is, I never thought of it that way. The way that they have been able to present the gospel is by filling in the, the breaks, the cracks. And you know what fill, you know, fills in the cracks of the gospel? Humanity. Jesus was a human being, and the people around him were human beings too. And they lived and they talked and they did stuff just like the rest of us. So the chosen really makes the gospel accessible in a different way. 
and, and personal in a different way. So it's been wonderful. If you've missed it with us, I'm sorry. We're probably going to take a break after this Wednesday for a little bit, but we choose, it is the group that chooses what we do. So if you've missed this, but you want to be in on what we do next, then let me know. We'll come together on Zoom and we will decide. It's the same thing with the Thursday night Bible study. So right now we're doing Tobit, which is a deuterocanonical book, an apocryphal book, right? intertestamental book, all the same thing. And, and why are we studying Tobit? Because when was the last time you studied Tobit? Nobody ever studies the, uh, the intertestamental books, and for a good reason, because there's a lot of other books to study. But we, the group, decided, hey, let's do Tobit to find out what this is all about. So we are studying Tobit right now. We have a bit left. If you want to come on Thursday night, 7.30 to 8.30, we go through the book of Tobit, we read it, and then we go, th go talk about it and see what it is. Tobit is a folk folklore. The intertestamental books are, for us, books that are edifying in what they say, but they are not binding in, in how they say it. And that is easy to see in Tobit because it goes off the rails now and then. Right? <laughs> but you have to come to know that. So when we get done with Tobit, which is going to be in a little while because Tobit is really fast, it's, known, it's really easy, um, we're going to go on to other Bibles, other, other books in the Bible. If you want to do a Bible study and you've said, I always wanted to do Ezra, we never did Ezra before, then come because it's the group that chooses the book. And when Tobit is done, you all choose what book, and we'll do that book. And then you can be in on a Bible study that you always wanted to do and never had a chance to do. Why doesn't Father Bill do that one? Okay? Now's your, now's your moment. Now's the time where we can do it. Enough said. All right. I got the other stuff out here. Please read and go through it and see what's happening. If you have any questions, if you ever fall off the list, please call Mary in the church office. Uh, electronic glitches do happen. I was removed from the list a little while ago. <laughs> <laughs> so it does happen. It's a real easy fix. Just call and tell her, and she'll put you right back on. All right. Other announcements? Birthdays. Anniversaries. Remember that we receive uh, the Eucharist in both kinds, and you have the option of receiving the bread and drinking from the cup, or if you want to be want to intinct, you don't get to do that anymore. I have a special cup that is not the other cup, and I will take the bread and intinct it for you and give it to you. Now, someone asked me last week if if when I do that they can I can just put it on their tongue. A absolutely, I've done that every year with people. So if you want me to just put it on your tongue, just you know what to do, right? <laughs> right? If you don't want me to do that, I will just put it in your hand, okay? And the way you let me know is don't do this. If you want me to intinct for you, you, want, you don't want to drink out of the chalice. It's a different cup, so it's not the same. You don't want to drink out of the chalice. If you go like this, I'm going to think you just want the bread and you're going to eat it. You have to do something else. Make a fist, or I say put your fingers like this, like you're holding a wafer, and then I will intinct for you. And if I'm confused at all, I will ask you, and you can just tell me. All right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to the end that all who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. When we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died, rose, and ascended for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Body of Christ.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Alleluia. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.